Hey guys. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Cemeteries Down Under and part two of Rookwood Cemetery. Um, did you know Rookwood was named Rookwood because of the amount of crows that we have in this cemetery? So that was one of the reasons why it was called Rookwood. Um, we're going to show you a few more characters that are buried here and a bit more areas of the cemetery and we're also going to show you inside one of the beautiful indoor vaults that they have here. They have about three indoor mausoleums but we'll show you inside the biggest one. And I hope you like the episode and um, catch you soon. Catch you soon guys. Hi guys, here we're at one of the indoor mausoleums called the Eternal Chapel of Internal Rest. There's three big chapels here. chapels, beautiful fountains, indoor vaults, um, but they don't come cheap. The indoor vaults are around 300,000, so um, they're quite beautiful, so I'm going to show you inside.
So here is the more colourful character of Rookwood, B. Miles. And she was an Australian eccentric and bohemian rebel. Described as Sydney's iconic eccentric, she was known for her contentious relationships with the city taxi drivers and for her ability to quote any passage from Shakespeare for money. So she was born in Ashfield, New South Wales, to Maria and John Miles. And she lived in a very well-to-do family in St Ives. He was a wealthy public accountant and hot-headed businessman who had a strained relationship with B. She studied at Abbotsley School and enrolled in an arts course but then dropped out, citing a lack of Australian subject matter. Miles also enrolled in medicine, which was unusual for women at that time, but in the first year she contracted a cephalitis. The disease permanently and profoundly changed her personality, but not her intelligence, such that she was unable to finish her studies and become an eccentric and notorious identity in and around Sydney. In 1923, tired of his daughter's bohemian behaviour and lifestyle, um, Miles, the father, had her committed in a mental hospital for the insane in Glebe, New South Wales, where she stayed for two years. After that, B lived on the street and was well known for her outrageous behaviour. She was arrested many times and claimed to have been falsely convicted 195 times, but fairly 100 times. And for a while, Miles was living in a cave behind one of Sydney's beaches. She received a small monthly income from her father's estate and she drew on this to pay her debts. It is said that she always carried a five pound note pinned to her skirts so that police could not arrest her for vagrancy. So her most notorious escapades involved taxi drivers. She regularly refused to pay fares. Some drivers refused to pick her up and she would sometimes damage the cab in retaliation, including reputedly ripping a door off its hinges. In 1955, Miles took a taxi to Perth and back, but this time she did pay the fare, £600. On Christmas Day 1956, she interrupted a taxi driver's festive dinner and demanded him drive her to Broken Hill via Melbourne. On their return, she paid the fare of £73. It also said she would sit in the Sydney bank smoking cigarettes under a sign reading gentlemen will refrain from smoking. Music lovers who attended the regular free Sunday afternoon concerts given by Sydney Town Hall may recall now just before the performance began Miles would often appear and wander up and down the aisles calling out for Ruby. She was well educated but landed a homeless woman and died of cancer at 71 in the hospice for the nuns, with the nuns. And um, she loved Australia and at a service they had wildflowers and they also played Advance Australia Fair and also um, when the saints came marching in. So here's a little honour to the most colourful lady of Sydney. So this is the Fraser Vault and this is the biggest mausoleum in the cemetery but it's got a really creepy story guys and I can't wait to tell you this story. So it was built in 1894 and it belonged to the Fraser family 
and there used to be seven people of the Fraser family buried in here. So John, the one that founded the mausoleum, and he was age 57, died in 1884. His son John, 1878. Arthur Griffiths, who died in 1900. Sarah and Alice Mary, they died in 1901. And his wife Elizabeth, 1914. Now the vault has their initials of John Fraser and his wife Elizabeth on the doors. But here's where it gets creepy. This vault is now empty. And it was commissioned by John Fraser prior to his death. Born in Ireland, Fraser immigrated with his brother and two sisters to Australia in 1842. In partnership with them, he built John Fraser & Co, one of Sydney's biggest businesses. Though John Fraser died relatively young, he died very rich, the third richest man in the country, leaving an estate worth over £400,000. Before his death, he commissioned the building of an elaborate and theft-proof mausoleum to contain himself, his family, for eternity, forever. It was never meant to be disturbed, and in reality, it was to hold them all less than a century. In 1974, Mr Manning, who was then the manager of Independent Cemetery here at Rookwood, received a bizarre telephone call at his office. A funeral director requested permission to remove the coffins of the Frasers from the vault. Apparently a distant relative of John wanted to have their remains cremated at the crematorium. The undertaker was merely following the directions of the relative. Unable to believe that anyone would want to do such a thing, Merv decided to meet the person. The lady seemed nice enough, she was the great granddaughter of John Fraser but determined to have her ancestors removed no matter what the cost. The whole crew of people assembled on the day that the bodies were to be exhumed. It took a week for the experienced mason to dismantle every onyx sarcophagus. Each had been designed never to be opened after being sealed. Despite this, great care was taken to ensure that nothing was damaged. Mr Manning made the mason number each section in the hope one day maybe someone would put them back together again. When the first crypt lid came off, a strange smell filled the room. It was not decay. The occupants had been dead for years. It was some kind of gas, perhaps methane. One by one, as each tomb was opened, the sweet-smelling vapour sealed for decades inside the stone vessels drifted out. The lady was adamant that every person was to be removed. Armed with records of who was buried there, each coffin had to be identified, opened and matched to the old registers. When the lids were removed, the coffins inside were found to be in very good condition, but they discovered something really unsettling. And they never told us what they discovered. And there's rumours that these people were devil worshippers, or worse, they were vampires. So, you know, it's a really creepy story. And anyone that comes to this cemetery sees this vault. It's a famous vault, but it's so beautiful and yet empty. No one to rest in there ever again. Okay, now here lies the man, Robert Hancock. Um, you can see by his statue, he was quite an ominous figure and he's got a little dog that stands for loyalty and he's got a scroll with different designs on his, in his hand. I'm not sure what they mean, but I'd love to look them up. But um, Robert Hancock, he was the builder of the original Sydney Tower and that was built in 1840. It was a 50-foot shot tower on George Street has an observation platform at the top and um, there was a lot of rumors about this tower and one of the rumors was that he had the tower to imprison his wife in and um, another theory is it was to deter thieves but whatever the mystery is um, it's one of the most knowledgeable graves here in Rookwood with its unusual design.
So here's the monument and grave for the Anthony Horden and his wife and family. Um, there's a few Hordens grave here, but the Horden and Sons were once the largest department store in Sydney, New South Wales. With 52 acres of retail space, Anthony Horden's was once the largest department store in the world. The historic Anthony Horden building, which was located on a block bounded by George Street, Liverpool and Pitt and Goulburn Streets, which is the main streets of Sydney City, on what was a small hill called Brickfield Hill in the city central business district, was controversially demolished in 1986 to make way for the World Square development. I want to say thank you for watching part two we hope it was interesting and look out for part three we'll have a lot more exciting stories about rookwood like i said this cemetery is so huge um, you could go on and on with the stories of the people buried here but i'm just taking a, a notable few each episode so i hope you enjoyed it look out for our next one stay tuned and don't forget guys like subscribe and share this channel out guys and Stay tuned.